bend the knee and join me. Together, we will leave the world a better place than we found it. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Nerdy Multiverse in yet another breakdown. Today, we will be breaking down and giving our initial thoughts on the fifth episode of the second season of House of the Dragon. Of course, being the prequel series to Game of Thrones that takes place during a time known as the Dance of the Dragons from the books. This breakdown and the following ones as well will contain spoilers from the source material. So this is your spoiler warning, you have been warned. And the fifth episode of this season being titled Regent. Now before we get started with the episode, episode itself, there are always two sides to a story, and there are two sides to this war. Team Green and Team Black. If you wish to choose your side and represent them until the very end, feel free to check out our merch made just for you to pick your side. The link is in the description down below. Anyways though, this episode begins on Driftmark. Of course, being the home to House Valarian, a place that was seen a ton in the first season, but not so much this season until now of course. As we see Corliss approaching the throne, here, and then sitting in it as he grieves the death of his wife and the queen who never was, Rhaenys Targaryen, who we of course lost at the Battle of Rook's Rest in the previous episode alongside her dragon, Maelise. And speaking of Maelise, we then cut to King's Landing as Kristen Cole and his forces return to the city after the Battle of Rook's Rest, with the head of Maelise being displayed in front of the small folk of the city, as a sort of trophy and sign of their victory. However, this was a terrible decision. We can hear the small folk in the background calling this a dark omen and saying that Rhaenyra will answer for it. Not only do people frown upon this action, but this will also begin to open everybody's eyes. Dragons are not the gods everyone thought they were, and neither are the Targaryens. Their dragons can be killed and defeated just as anyone else. This will eventually lead into a horrific event and one that was remembered for ages, known as the Storming of the Dragon Pit. As they ride through the streets, both Alicent and Aemond watch over from atop the Red Keep. As they see the box that carries the burnt and scarred King Aegon. Alicent also looks over at Aemond and notices that he is carrying the Valyrian steel dagger that is carried by the king usually. So now she knows Aemond had something to do with what occurred at Rook's Rest. As the king's soldiers, maesters, and servants of the Seven carry the king back to his room to tend to him, we can once again see the faith of the Seven symbol displayed in the Red Keep, as the newly dressed green and gold Targaryen soldiers make their way through the halls as well. We see when Aegon is laid in his bed for the maesters to begin taking care of him, his Valerian steel armor has melted to his skin and his bones have broken all across his body, just as described in the book, as it reads as follows. Aegon suffered from burns that covered half his body, a broken hip and numerous broken ribs. His armor had melted into his left arm and it would take him a year to recover. His mind clouded by milk of the poppy, causing him to sleep nine hours out of every ten. He did not rise from his bed for the rest of the year, and some say he prayed for his death. Only his mother, Queen Alicent, and his hand, Sir Criston Cole, were allowed to disturb his rest. Prince Aemond took over the rule in his stead as Prince Regent and Protector of the Realm. Aegon remained bent and twisted for the rest of his life. Half his body covered in burn scars. End quote. When Aemond walks in here to look over at his burnt brother, he does mention that someone will need to lead in his place, at least until Aegon is better. 
This will take us into the meeting later on and the very title of this episode, as well as part of the passage that I just read off. Alicent walks in to question Kristen Cole on what happened at Rook's rest, and is seemingly losing trust in him as well as Aemond as well. He says that Aegon fought valiantly and cannot say what Aemond's role in the battle really was. We then cut to Dragonstone as Rhaenyra meets with her very questionable counsel once more, as they urge for action to be taken more than ever. They have lost their largest available dragon and a great ally in Rhaenys, as well as the fortress of Rook's Rest itself. Sir Alfred Broom is always the lead of these sort of actions against Rhaenyra. But Rhaenyra shuts him up as they both were raised in eras of peace, so neither of them have seen a great amount of battle. So they have an equal amount of knowledge. We then see Bela and Jaceris meet as Jace is eager to take action himself and finally get out of Dragonstone. He wishes to head to Harrenhal to get word from his uncle Daemon. But Bela convinces him not to and promises him that Rhaenyra is only protecting him by keeping him here. He decides that he will head to the twins to meet with the Freys, to provide passage for Lord Cregan Stark's Greybeards, as well as possibly swaying the lords that oversee the Riverlands over to Rhaenyra's side. We then cut to Daemon himself as he bears his dragon armor as he sits atop his dragon, Caraxes, alongside House Blackwood, as they meet with House Bracken. Now here, Daemon tells them to bend the knee to him, not Rhaenyra, further showcasing that struggle with his ascension to the Iron Throne being denied to him ever since birth. The Brackens, of course, refuse and decide to go with fire. And as they ride off, we get an amazing shot of Caraxes staring them down from behind as they ride off. Damon then sends Willem Blackwood and his men to go after the Brackens to quote unquote persuade them. Obviously, that will not happen peacefully though, as we hear about later on. And finally, we cut to the incredible stronghold of the Eyrie in the Vale, which, by the way, has changed its design for the third time now, I believe. This is the same location that Tyrion Lannister was held prisoner in Game of Thrones and with that infamous Moon Door. Here we see Reyna meeting with Lady Jane Arryn, the cousin to Rhaenyra's late mother, Aima Targaryen who has agreed to give her armies to Team Black, in return for protection by that of a dragon. So Reyna has come here with Joffrey and two dragon eggs, obviously with the plan of bringing dragons, although they are not hatched. Now in the book, Reyna does finally get a dragon known as Morning, a bright pink colored dragon and Joffrey obtains the dragon of Tyraxes. It is very possible that Reyna will be mixed with the character from the source material known as Nettles, and also claim a dragon known as Sheepstealer, one of the three wild dragons. Heading back to Dragonstone as Rhaenyra meets with Mysaria in front of the skull of the old dragon of Meraxes, the dragon that belonged to the first Rhaenys Targaryen, one of Aegon the Conqueror's sister wives. Mysaria further doubles down on the fact that Kristen Cole made a mistake displaying a dragon head in front of the small folk, and urges Rhaenyra to have things done for her by others as there is more than one way to fight a war. As we see them send Rhaenyra's most loyal maid, Elinda Massey, to King's Landing. Rhaenyra then meets with Bela as the two reminisce on the memory of Rhaenys. Rhaenys may have not always been fond of Rhaenyra, but in the end, the two were so similar to one another and Rhaenys fought for that cause until the very end, showing true loyalty. Rhaenyra then tells Bela to go meet with Corlys. 
We then cut to Hall as Damon once again has more of his dreams or visions. Which is something that did occur in the book itself, but it was hardly touched on in it. And this one that happens here is just absolutely gross. Damon, well, gets with a woman that is clearly a Targaryen as she says he was made to wear a crown only if he was born first, as it is revealed that the woman in this vision is his own mother that he never really knew as she died when he was only a child. This is Elisa Targaryen who was actually the very first writer of Melis. He is then awakened by Simon Strong, thank God, as the two meet and discuss their plans further. As they plan to make Harrenhal a great host for the Brackens and the Blackwoods. Simon urges for some pay for all of this as Lara Strong has control over all of the gold here. Damon promises for some pay but Simon wishes for gold from the queen herself. Before leaving, Damon tells Simon to refer to him as your grace and king. But Simon really just shuts that down here as he doesn't do so and only refers to him as king consort. He is not the ruler that is meant to sit the throne, Rhaenyra is, and that is who these people are loyal to. Damon is only her husband. Cutting to Alicent in the High Council as they meet, discussing the fate of Aegon and how they require someone to lead in his place. Everyone in the room goes for who would be next in line, which is Aemond. Even though Alicent volunteered herself, this shows that not only Rhaenyra was blocked off by any sort of power and ignored because she was a woman, but Alicent as well. She is not immune to this herself, as she may have thought she was. Aemond is practically voted in as Prince Regent and Protector of the Realm. At least for the time being as Aegon recovers from his brutal injuries. One of my favorite passages from the book that talk about the Prince Regent arc reads as follows. And so one-eyed Aemond, the Kinslayer, took up the iron and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror. It looks better on me than it ever did on him, the prince proclaimed. Yet, Aemond did not assume the style of king, but named himself only protector of the realm and prince regent. Anyways, as Alicent sits there in shock that she was pushed away from power so easily like that, Aemond immediately sits down and starts giving out orders. She goes out to meet with Kristen again and he mentions here that they were unsure of Sunfire's fate, and that he was left in the field at Rook's Rest with a small force of men to occupy the fortress. This also was discussed in the book. Nobody believed Sunfire to survive the battle, but just as Aegon, his rider, Sunfire also lives, despite the rumors and their intense injuries. Alicent also absolutely shuts Kristen down here as she says that she did not give him leave to speak her name. Finally, somebody humbles him. Hugh Hammer and his wife have growing suspicions that the king's promises were all lies, and they plan on leaving with their daughter, which will also play into the calling of the dragon seeds. We then cut to the twins as Jaceris' dragon, Vermax, looks over at the iconic bridge. Of course, the twins is the same location where one of the worst events occurred in Game of Thrones, known as the Red wedding. The Twins is also one of the most important locations in Westeros. It is the only way to cross the Green Fork, being the route from Winterfell to River Run. Armies constantly use this bridge to cross over and march to their objective, as we did see Robb Stark attempt to do in Game of Thrones. Jaceris is here meeting with the phrase himself. They do again mention Grover Tully who is too old to come to any sort of meeting. The two Freys here mention how they are afraid of Vagar, which is why they are so hesitant on picking sides and allowing passage to Rhaenyra's forces. This reminds me of the passage from A Dance with Dragons. Prince Aemond had become the terror of the trident, descending from the sky to rain fire and death upon the riverlands. 
seconds, then vanishing, only to strike again the next day, 50 leagues away. Jace does also mention here that Vagar is leagues away. Well, his dragon, Vermax, is just over their walls. He promises them his protection and the protection from his uncle Damon and his dragon, Caraxes. The phrase also wish to have Harrenhal. But Jace says that can only happen if they bend their knees to Rhaenyra and her cause. And speaking of Harrenhal, we cut to the fortress, as Damon and others begin renovating and repairing it from the damages caused many, many years ago by Aegon the Conqueror and his dragon, Balerion the Black Dread. Damon begins hearing voices and screams, so he goes to speak with Alice Rivers, who tends to his damaged hands. Damon's struggle with the throne is shown once again as he swears that people will still struggle with Rhaenyra sitting the throne even when they take King's Landing, and that he will need to take charge himself. Now, Alice Rivers ends up mocking him about his mother and how he never knew her. So it's quite clear that Alice is likely causing these hauntings and is very aware of what they are about. Cutting to Corliss as Bela walks over to meet with him, and I know I am not the only one that noticed she walked almost exactly like Rhaenys. Anyways though, the two discuss Rhaenys herself, and just like in the book, Corliss is taking the death of his wife very hard as he does sort of blame Rhaenyra and lashes out against her. Bela tells him that Rhaenyra wishes to name him Hand, which also did happen in the book. And she says that she is going to continue to fight for the same thing that Rhaenys did, and she wishes to die even like her, in the battlefield amongst Dragonfire. Now, Corlys does say that he wishes to name Bela as his heir to Driftmark here, before she leaves. But she declines as she is of fire and blood, and Driftmark belongs to Salt and Sea. This is a hint at the future heir of Driftmark being named, someone we have already met in the series being Alan of Hull. With Rhaenyra once more, as she sends Alfred Broom to Harrenhal to get word from Daemon. She knows Alfred is quote-unquote loyal to her, regardless of his disruptions in court, so this is why she is sending him. Damon is then woken up by Simon Strong, who says that the River Lords are here to meet with Damon specifically, as the Blackwoods have gone too far with their march against their ancient rivals, the Brackens. The River Lords all refuse to bend the knee to what they call a tyrant, who would have the Blackwoods march against against them and their women and children. And as Damon leans against the fireplace reflecting on this, we then cut to the same exact shot, but of Rhaenyra on the opposite side, showcasing their divide and how different the two really are. Using Missaria's connections around King's Landing, Alinda goes and meets with the character known as Diana. This is the same girl who was assaulted by Aegon in Season 1. Now, it is unclear why Alinda is meeting with Diana, but they could be planning to reveal this information to the public. The king is someone who assaults women, and his mother hid that information as well. Alinda could also be here for the dragon seeds as well. Now, within the throne room of the Red Keep, Aemond, now the Prince Regent, looks over the Iron Throne, as Helena approaches him from behind and questions whether it was worth the price or not. She likely knows exactly what he did as she is likely to be a dreamer herself, someone who is able to see future events before they even happen. The price? His brother being burnt alive, which is who we see next as he lays in bed just as his father Viserys did when he was sickly. Alicent looks over him and then leaves the room. And as she leaves the room, we can hear Aegon try to call out for his mother, but it is only a mumble. This is a reflection on how he has always gone to her when in need. Back with Rhaenyra as she looks over the history books of the Targaryens. 
Athens. Once again, she looks over pages of Visenya Targaryen, someone she looks up to greatly. Visenya was the very first rider of Vagar and a former wielder of Daemon's sword, Dark Sister. Jace enters the room and the two end up discussing the need of more dragons. Vagar is weakened after the battle with Melis, and they need dragons now more than ever. Especially because Damon and his dragon are MIA. Jace mentions two dragons that are large enough to contend with Vagar alone, Vermithor and Silverwing. Now, if we go based off of the books, Vermithor is the third largest dragon to have ever lived. Behind Balerion and Vagar, of course. And Silverwing being right behind Vermithor. Although it is believed the wild dragon known as the Cannibal is likely in similar size to those two. But he is not tameable and the cannibal size has always been based off of rumors and never actually confirmed. Vermithor was formally bonded to Jaehaerys Targaryen and Silverwing belonged to Alicent Targaryen. Rhaenyra says that they have no riders for these two, but Jace mentions that there are others out there, those that are a part of their bloodline that fell out. Some would call them bastards, but they are also referred to as dragon seeds. They will look through their records and call upon these people. A few passages from the source material recall this and they read as follows. It was to them that Prince Tesseris turned, at the urging of his fool, vowing that any man who could master a dragon would be granted lands and riches and dubbed a knight. His sons would be ennobled, his daughters wed to lords, and he himself would have the honor of fighting beside the Prince of Dragonstone against the pretender Aegon Targaryen II and his treasonous supporters, as well as yet Sea Smoke, Vermithor, and Silverwing were accustomed to men and tolerant of their presence. Having once been ridden, they were more accepting of new riders. Vermithor the old king's own dragon bent his neck to a blacksmith's bastard, a towering man called Hugh the Hammer or Hard Hugh, whilst a pale-haired man at arms named Ulf the White for his hair or Ulf the Sot for his drinking mounted Silverwing, beloved of good queen Alison, and Sea Smoke, who had once borne Lanar Valerion, took onto his back a boy of ten and five known as Adam of Hull, whose origins remain a matter of dispute amongst historians to this day. Now, the passage also obviously mentions that of Sea Smoke. This is because the former dragon of Lanor's has no rider now. He too will be claimed by a dragon seed. The notable dragon seeds that go on to become dragon riders in the source material are Ulf the White, Hugh Hammer, Adam Hall, and Nettles. However, Nettles has likely been removed from the series, which is very unfortunate as she was an incredible character. But anyways, as Rhaenyra and Jace look over to begin their search through their line records, the episode ends off. Overall, a very good episode in my opinion, and another emotional one, where we really felt the grief and aftermath of the previous episode. The buildup for the future with dragons and dragon seeds was really good and really well done. And the division is really showing as well. I am getting a little tired of the Damon visions, but I would still probably give this episode an 8.5 out of 10 for me. And I cannot wait for next week's episode. But yeah, that about does it for this episode, from me at least, but of course I would like to hear your thoughts on the episode as well, so make sure to leave them down below. Thank you all for watching, if you enjoyed our breakdown and review on this episode, don't forget to give it a like. And with that being said, we will see you all the next time that we go through and explore the nerdy multiverse.